Almost 11 years ago, my father passed away from cancer. And I went down, I got, actually was out on a Sunday, I got a phone call from my brother, and I was living in Fort St. John at the time, and I just preached that morning, and that afternoon my brother called and said my dad was in the hospital, that uh, um, this was it. So I flew down that afternoon, and I spent the last couple days with him, the uh, last couple days of his life with him. And then it came time for the funeral. And as a pastor, you know, there's this thing, oh, you know, Brian, you need to do the funeral. And I thought, I wasn't sure emotionally, you know, how I'd be able to handle it and how to do all the funeral preparation. So I got together with my brothers, and we met with a friend of mine, Mark Buchanan, who's a uh, pastor. And, well, he was a pastor my whole time, he's a teacher at Ambrose now. And we put the service together. And in the end, I would be the one to do the scripture reading, and I would be the one who would lead the singing, and my brothers would do the eulogy, and, and Mark would do at the end of the service, we had everybody come down, you know, had the open casket, and everybody came to the front and, you know, paid their respects and, and said hi and all that. I had so many people come up to me and said, I didn't know you could sing. I didn't know you could talk in front of people. And it kind of struck me because they thought, you know, this is my hometown. I spent the first uh, 27 years of my life, for the most part, living in this town. And they thought, you know, they didn't know who I was. They thought I was still Sonny Lum's son. They thought I was still the salesman's son. And they didn't realize the person that I had become since moving away. There's a saying that goes, familiarity breeds contempt. And I just got to pull a few uh, definitions uh, from that. In the New Dictionary of Cultural Literacy, it says, the better we know people, the more likely we're to find fault. The Free Dictionary says, if you know someone very well or experience something a lot, you stop respecting them. And then the usingenglish.com online says, the more you know something or someone, the more you start to find faults and dislike things about it or them. And in our text today, we find an example of that. See, Jesus was returning home to his hometown in Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And for those going here, going uh, who lived in different places, that you know, there's something unique about going what they call home, and back to where you're from. In fact, it's, it's kind of a, a two-edged sword going back to your hometown because you're kind of excited maybe to see family and friends and stuff. But then there's a sense of uneasiness because I think home changed. More importantly, you have changed, and I have changed. So when I go home, it's a, little, it's a little weird. And the first thing we notice from this passage is that when Jesus came home, that the community took offense at him. You see, Jesus was a rabbi. Okay? Jesus went around and met his disciples, and he was teaching them as he was going. And what rabbis would do when they come to a community, they'd go in to the synagogue, and they would open up the scriptures and teach. And so Jesus, coming home as a visiting rabbi, he went into his uh, local synagogue and gave a reading. And we see in verse 2 that they were, they were impressed. Okay, look at what he's doing here. But then, they started questioning the authority by which he spoke. And I think part of it was because they thought that Jesus was still the little boy, the carpenter's son, that they knew growing up. They didn't see him as anything more. They knew him as a carpenter. You see, it was pretty common in those days, and even in our generation today, for kids to fall along in their parents' footsteps. You know, there's people like, like over Tracy's family, her parents are teachers, her, her sister is a teacher. You know, it's kind of like, it kind of goes like that. And in my family, my dad had a business selling produce, and there was this kind of expectation that he would, you know, take on the family mantle and continue on in the business. And what happened was Jesus, because he was the son of a carpenter, suddenly went off and became his rabbi, his teacher, he wasn't fulfilling what they saw as his destiny. You know, he was supposed to follow in his father's footsteps. But it also wasn't that. They knew Jesus' family very well. In fact, his mother and brothers were, are named here, and his sisters. Now, how many of you have ever been known by your siblings? Like, if you're a younger brother, and you go to the same, or younger sister, or whatever, you go to the same school as your, as your older brother or sister, and they say, oh, you're so-and-so's brother, you're so-and-so's sister. And it's like, you already have the stigma, right? You have these certain expectations, especially if your older brother, like for me, I had two older brothers, and they were big 
big rugby players. Okay? They all like sports and stuff. And so I come into school, and, and I mean, they were, they were heavy by seven and eight years, but it was like the expectation was, oh, well, I'm going to do the same things they did. And so we put all these things together. Because of all that they believe that Jesus should be, they question his authority and took offense at what he was saying. And the word offense here is the same word that we get the word scandal. And this led, of course, to the famous saying that Jesus said, only in his hometown, among his relatives, in his own house, is a prophet without honor. And in many ways, what Jesus said is there's no more. The people's familiarity with Jesus' early life and his family prejudiced what Jesus had become. They prejudiced their view, and they didn't respect him for the man that he was. And this resulted in limited effectiveness for Jesus' ministry. The things that he did in each community, you read throughout scripture, and he talks about going from community to community, all these miracles he would do, the teaching he would do. But when he came home, it was hard to do anything he could do. His, his ministry was so limited. And I feel sad for the community. Because here was a missed opportunity that Jesus came. He was coming back home. He was there to do great things, to teach great things, and all they thought was, not you again. A lost opportunity. I was reading a story about uh, Seth Godin. He was telling a story about a lost opportunity where he was in his first year at Stanford Business School. He went to see this man named Jim Levy who at the time was the president of Activision. And I know Activision in my day was like, you know, the, the, the uh, Playstations and all these kind of things. He, he, they, he, they made uh, games for the Atari systems. And at the time it was like, you know, that's like Pong, right? That kind of thing. But it was really like, you know, he was at the, he was at the, the apex of their industry. And so he went to him and he said, why don't you go into the computer gaming
Or else, I remember when I was dating a uh, youth in a church, in my home church, many years ago, and they were like, some parents were like, oh, don't, don't do the Bible, don't have a Bible study with the youth, because you get nothing in Sunday school. You know, don't preach, don't read scripture too much, use more illustrations. And I wonder, how have we become too ready? So why do I want to ask ourselves today, do I really allow allow our familiarity to breathe content? Do we truly see Jesus? Do we see his word as we should? Do we have the same measure of reverence for Christ that we did when we first came to know him? You know, one of the biggest dangers in our faith and in community and our relationships is taking one another for granted. And I think as those of us who are married, we sometimes do that with our spouses. Those of us who are kids, I think we often take our parents for granted as well. Until that day that they're gone, when we wonder what happened. And sometimes, too, we take Jesus for granted. And oftentimes, we don't appreciate the significance of the Word of God in the Bible. Do we see the Bible as living? Do we see the Bible as an active two-edged sword in our lives? Do we see the Bible as our spiritual food? See, if we don't, what happens is the foundation of our lives, our faith, then becomes almost covered up. And you know, the sad thing was for Jesus' countrymen, they had that same attitude towards him. Because even though they heard the stories of Jesus going around doing all these miracles and teaching, when he came back home, he became Jesus, Joseph's son. And for those of you who are older, you know, when you go back to your parents, and you, when you, with your, you know when you go with your parents? Your parents are now you act differently. And they always have that same thing about Jesus. When he came home, it's like, oh, you need to act like this now. You can't be this radical creature. You have to be Jesus. The carpenter's son. It's interesting here because Jesus made comments about the lack of faith. And he was amazed at the faith. He was amazed at the fact that here he was preaching God's word, and they were kind of like, so what? But then does Jesus have that same reaction to us when we hear God's word? We see in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 4, that they were so upset with Jesus that they even tried to kill him. Their familiarity with Jesus led them to be unwilling to believe. And in Matthew 13, it says that Jesus couldn't do much in their community because of their unbelief. J.G. Miller comments, he said, Such unbelief as this has immense consequences for evil. It closes the channels of grace and mercy so that only a trickle gets through to human lives and need. You see, what happened was their attitude closed the door of their hearts and minds to receiving what God wanted to do with God's blessing. So again, I ask each of us here today, are we experiencing the same thing in our lives? Do we have this complacency with God, this kind of lazy care attitude with Him, that we miss out on what God wants to do in our lives? I just want to go through a few things, a few examples of that. The Bible. Is it a book? Is it just a book? When you bring it to church on Sunday, if you bring it to church on Sunday, you go home to just sit on the shelf and collect dust. Or is it living the right God? Does it contain truth? Practical teaching? Is it the Word of God? You know, it's funny that they put, put that verse in, in 1 Peter 2 too, like newborn babes, pray pure spiritual milk, so that that fire may grow in your salvation. That's kind of fun. But also fellowship. What does church mean to you? What does the family of God mean to you? Is it just Sunday morning? The church is about community. It's about relationships. Gathering together to worship God. Encouraging one another in our journey with Him. Serving together. I love hearing that story, that testimony about what happened because of Prince Edward I think that's great. Because all that is important to spreading each of us on in our walk with God. Hebrews. 10, 24, and 25 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as somewhere in the house. But let 
let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. What about prayer? Do we just pray as a blessing before each meal, or say a prayer at that time? Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says, Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so we may receive mercy and find grace to help our child. Do you see prayer as First, our Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but everything by prayer and petition and thanksgiving present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do we pray? Do we believe in prayer? And then there's Jesus himself. Hebrews 10, 29 says, How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished? who has trampled the Son of God on the foot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace. And you know, I ask this, and I do it with sincerity, but do we take Jesus and what he's done for us in front Is our familiarity with God, with Jesus, the Bible, all these things bring contempt in our lives? Maybe you're here and you're thinking, you know, my spiritual life is a little dull. But when you look at the people of Nazareth, they saw Jesus as he once was. And they would refuse to see Jesus for who he had become. And my concern for us as Christians is do we see Jesus the same way as or the way that we should? Or do we see Jesus in a different light? Maybe in a way that the Nazareth people of Nazareth. See, I believe our hearts can be hard and opposed to the awesomeness of Jesus, to his love, his power, and his grace. And in doing that, I think sometimes we miss the blessings that he has for us in our lives. You know, this morning we're sharing in the Lord's Supper and communion. And the church that Trace and I were attending in Calgary, we meet the communion every week. And I love that. Because it was a reminder, it was a help for me to stop and to refocus again on who Jesus is and what he's done for me. And my hope and prayer for each of us here, you know, we're all at different places in our lives by walk with God. You know, maybe some here, you know, you come to church, you're raised in the church, and you're not quite sure. But I want to encourage you. Jesus is who he says he is. And that what communion does, it allows us to refocus our lives, to sort of get, get in tune with God again. And I hope and pray that as we share together in a few moments, that this would be an opportunity for each of us to really get reconnected with God again. Because if we don't, we'll miss out on